Anyway, so hi everybody. So who here has done some home automation before? Cool, quite a few people, awesome. All right, I'm going to tell you about my home automation experiences. But first, let me introduce myself. My name is Gergana, but I usually go by Jerry because that's a little bit easier to pronounce. I recently became a Microsoft MVP in Windows development. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. I'm at a Linux conference and I'm Windows development MVP, but we're all about community, right? So we share. Right. If you want to know more about me, you can check out my website, follow me on Twitter, follow some of the other weird stuff I do in my house. Whoa. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> never mind, I'm just going to leave that. <laughs> I work for BBD, we're a software development firm, and I work in the R&D team. And a lot of people ask me what we do in the R&D team. So the plain, boring answer is we do consulting and research and training of the rest of the BBD staff. But that's the boring answer. We also do things like build meme generators, fly drones with bananas, and my personal favorite, program astromech droids. And this is pretty much how I started up, programming my little robot. I did a few talks on this, and I kind of quickly became known as that robot girl. And with that, I programmed a whole bunch of other things and robots. And some were more successful than others, as you can see by this tweet. <laughs> and most of the time, I get robots or things, devices, program them in new and creative ways using JavaScript. But recently, my husband asked me, what about me? Because I had programmed so many things. I've even written tutorials of how to automate things in your house. But I've never done any of them for myself or for our house. Even, for those of you who may have heard of it, the wine button that I created is not actually in use today. So I decided it was time to automate something at home. And I decided that that thing should be our garage doors. Because I don't know if other people experience this. Maybe it's just our garage doors that are weird. But sometimes you push the one button and the wrong garage door opens. And sometimes you just forget to close the garage doors. And we have this really friendly neighbor who always posts on the local WhatsApp group when someone's garage door is open, because it happens to my other neighbors too. And it's, it's, although we kind of make fun of him, it's really nice that he does that, because, you know, security reasons, it, you should close your garage doors. The only problem is when it's the middle of winter and you're already in bed, and you don't want to go downstairs to close your garage doors because it's cold outside. So that's why I decided I'd start there. And I decided that I would use Mozilla Web Things. Now, Mozilla Web Things is an open source implementation of the Web of Things standard. But before we can talk more about Mozilla Web Things itself, we need to talk about what the Web of Things is. And before we can talk about what the Web of Things is, we need to talk about that one very famous buzzword, the Internet of Things. IoT has become one of the biggest buzzwords of our time. And the promise of IoT is that we can automate absolutely everything from this very smart computer to a bottle of water and connect it. Everything in the physical world to be connected to be able to share data. Now, if you think about the computing power we have, this should be possible, right? But why haven't we done it yet? Well, because IoT has a few problems. Let's talk about those problems. The first is fragmentation. When you have one simple sensor, it doesn't provide you with enough information to be able to get something valuable out of it. 
you have to combine a number of different sensors to create a smart device, which means that you need to be able to understand how all of these sensors work, how to combine them, and how to program that one device. Then we have protocols. Everyone who has done something with IoT knows of the MQTT protocol. It's the one of the main ways of communicating with IoT devices. But it's not the only way. There's also AMQP, which is used by Windows IoT. There's Weave, which is used by Linux and Android Things. And there's also HomeKit, which is used by iOS devices. Now, those are just the popular ones. There's actually hundreds of different protocols out there. And in order to be able to use IoT devices, all of these different IoT devices, we need to understand all of the protocols and cater for them in our programs. Next, we have connection methods, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, NFC. All of these are different wireless connection methods. To support all of them means understanding all of them. And each one has its complications. We need to be able to understand them. And lastly, and probably most importantly, security. A friend of mine and I were chatting a little while ago, and he said to me, do you know what the S in IoT stands for? <laughs> I said, no, there's no S in IoT. What are you talking about? And his response was, yes, you're correct. There is no security in IoT. Take a look at this headline. This is not a joke. This is a real thing that happened to a casino, unnamed casino, obviously, for obvious reasons. But cyber criminals managed to hack into the casino's database via the thermostat in the fish tank that sat in the lobby of the casino and extract all of the high rollers information out of the casino, back out through the fish tank's thermostat into their own database. So, Security is already a hard problem, right? When we deal with it, no matter where we deal with it, security is hard. But when it comes to IoT, we're actually dealing, we're wading in uncharted waters here. Like we don't know how to even begin to do security when it comes to IoT. So this is where the web of things comes in. Because if we think about it, a lot of these problems have already been solved on the web. Through many years of experience on the web, we've developed protocols and standards that we can use to deal with things. Let's talk about HTTP, for example. HTTP has been around for a long time, and it solved the problem of being able to send information, pictures, data from one machine to another without the machines needing to understand what the underlying things are that work inside them. So that's what the Web of Things is, except a step further, where we're now talking about connecting to every physical device, taking anything and connecting it to the World Wide Web. Even if we talk about security problems on the web, I know you're going to say, but the web is insecure. It is, but that is not because there isn't a way to do security on the web. It's because we just don't do it right. Security on the web is there. We figured out how to do it. We just need to follow those same principles. So this is the formal definition of the web of things. The web of things is a refinement of the internet of things by integrating smart things not only into the internet, but into the web architecture. It's a high-level application protocol designed to optimize interoperability of the Internet of Things. So, in order to get a better understanding of the Web of Things, we need to talk a little bit about its architecture. The architecture of the Web of Things is there, so we can organize the protocols and tools of the web in such a way that we can connect it to physical devices. 
And in this way, we can connect anything to the web. It's a layered architecture, and it's got four layers. The first layer is the access layer. This is the layer where we want to turn anything into a web thing. And we do this by converting the data that the sensors give us into a REST-like API. Because we already know how to design RESTful APIs, we can turn that sensor data and design it in such a way that it's given to us over HTTP. That way, whenever you ask for a certain data point, you're given to it over HTTP. But now, what about real-time data? Because I don't want to query an API every time I want to know if my garage doors are open. I w just want to know that it's open. Well, then we use another protocol of the web, WebSocket. Provides us with real-time data, and we can see it and access it straight away. Now that we have our data, we need to be able to understand it. And for that, we use something else from the web, web semantic standards, to define how our devices look, what events and properties they can provide us with, so we know we're reading that data in JSON format, and we know how to find it when we create our web applications. It makes it easier to create user interfaces for these devices, makes it searchable in search engines, and it even makes it easy to post this data, if you so wish, on social media. Layer three is about sharing. IoT will only truly be a success if we can make sure that all of the devices can share data securely and efficiently. And this is what this layer is about. And we keep talking about security. And security on the web, things like TLS, we can use that to encrypt our IoT data because now our devices are available on the web. OAuth and OIDC, so we can control who actually gets to see that data based on log logins and things like that. It makes it easier. Again, it's not a sure thing that it will be secure, but it makes it easier for you to implement the security for your things. And then the last layer is about bringing everything together into large-scale enterprise-level applications. We can integrate the data and services from all of these web things that we've now connected to the web into the immense ecosystem of tools, like analytics tools and mashup platforms. Things like Node-RED support the web of things. All of this stuff is outlined in a standard on the W3C called the Web of Things by the Web of Things Working Group. And together with this one main standard, they're also working on a number of other standards to support each of the different layers. And the idea is to be able to give every physical device a URL so that you can access it on the web. Now we can talk about Mozilla Web Things. As we said earlier, Mozilla Web Things is an open source implementation of the Web of Things. It comes in two parts. There's the gateway and the framework. Now, the Web Things framework is a collection of reusable software components so that you can build your own web thing. So whatever devices you have, you can program them and build them using the WebThings framework. It will make it discoverable by the WebThings gateway, as well as any other client that's configured to look for things on the web. There are a number of different languages that are supported. Node.js, Python, Java, Rust, Arduino. And there's also a number of third-party libraries. Uh, there's a C-sharp one, and there's a couple other ones that other people have created. Because it's open source, if 
you find that there isn't one in the language you want to pr program in, then you can create a library for it. So now let's get to our first demo. Our first demo involves this little device over here. This is an ESP32 and it's connected to an LED. Okay. And what we're going to do is program it with the Arduino IDE and upload some code to it so that it becomes available on the web. So I know I said the Arduino IDE, but Visual Studio Code is much easier to use than the Arduino IDE. <laughs> And I'm not only saying that because I'm a Microsoft MVP. <laughs> All right. So for anyone who's worked in the Arduino IDE before, you will know this already, but I'm going to go over it just in case. You always have a setup method and a loop method. The setup method is where you write all of your startup code, what you do when you start up your device for the first time. And the loop method is a method that runs continuously in a loop. The first thing we're going to do is import a few libraries. So the things we're importing is firstly the Arduino library that is just for uh, the basic setup of the ESP32 board. The thing, the thing and web thing adapter are the two important libraries there that we need to talk about. Those are the two libraries that firstly make the ESP32 into its own little web server, so it can create a web server that we can connect to from a URL. And the, it also makes it into an adapter which is discoverable by the WebThings gateway, which we're going to take a look at later. Then the other things we're importing, Wi-Fi, so we can connect to Wi-Fi, and the config file which just has my uh, username and password for the Wi-Fi, which I'm not going to show you. <laughs> All right, once we've imported that, we need to do some definitions. We're defining firstly the LED pin, so the pin number that the LED on the Arduino web thing is plugged into, and a new web things adapter. Now we can define our actual web thing. Okay. And we do that firstly by defining the types of the thing. So we're saying that firstly it's going to be an on-off switch because we want to be able to turn the LED on and off from our gateway. And secondly, it's going to be a light because it's an LED. The last argument in this line here is to say that in case you want to define it as some custom thing, that's why it's null. Then we define our device as an LED, we give it a name, warning light, and we give it the types. And lastly, we define a property for this device, which is the on-off property, which is just a boolean, true or false, on or off. Now we can run our setup code. We're adding a serial in there, so we can debug our ESP32 and setting the pin mode to output because it's a LED, so it's output mode. Now we need to initialize the Wi-Fi and the adapter. To initialize the Wi-Fi, we just try Wi-Fi.begin. If it doesn't connect, we try it again in five seconds. To initialize the adapter, we create a new web things adapter. We call it light and we set it to the local IP address of the Wi-Fi, whatever it's connected to. We add the property and the device onto the adapter and then we say adapter.begin. All of these prints over here we're going to use so we can see what the actual URL of the thing is that we connect to. Now all our setup is done. All we need to do in our loop method is listen and update. So every time we loop through, we update the adapter value and check 
whether something has told the LED to turn on or off. That's it. That's all the code we need. Now, if we save this, plug this in over here. Just going to hang it there so we can... No, not right now. And we go on to you to upload the code. This is going to start uploading. You can see that Visual Studio Code actually relies on the Arduino IDE to upload the code onto the devices. Damn it. I think it's still going to work. Okay, so it's busy uploading. Oh, it's busy uploading. Um, it's almost done. There we go. If we open the serial monitor, it will open up at the bottom here. And there we go. It's already connected, and there's our URL. Now let's go to that URL and explore it a little bit. So you can see that this has provided us with a URL for our LED with JSON information about what exactly this device consists of. So we can see it's, a, it's called warning light. It has two types, on off switch and light. And it has a bunch of properties. So those are the on off properties. It has events, which is how we would control things, like send events from the thing to the gateway for example, and it also has an alternate web endpoint, which is our WebSockets endpoint, so that we can listen to it all the time. The only property we have defined on our LED is the on-off property, and if we go to it, oh, too many slashes there. You can see currently the LED is not on. So at this point, you could use something like curl or postman or something like that to post to the LED and it will turn it on or off. All right. Now let's go back here. Now that we've seen how the framework works, let's talk about the gateway. So the gateway is actually just a web application. And it's how you can control and monitor all of the devices in your house over the web without having any middleman or anything. No other smart devices needed. Just a computer to run this web application. And it has a number of things which we're going to go into in a moment, but there's a UI for controlling, there's a rules engine for automating things, so if this, do that, and there's a range of add-ons you can use as well. And again, with the add-ons, because it's open source, if you can't find an add-on for the device you want to connect to, you can code it yourself and submit a pull request. It's also a PWA, which is really cool, because I have it installed on my phone, which means it's app-like, and it works quite nicely on Android, at least. I haven't tried on iOS. But so. There's two ways of installing it. If you have a Raspberry Pi spare, you can download the Raspberry Pi distro and load it directly onto the SD card for your Raspberry Pi. You start it up, it works fine. The way I run it at home is I've just downloaded the code use, uh, from GitHub and you just run npm start and it starts up as well. Uh, I just have an old computer and I'm using PM2 to just keep it alive even if the computer restarts. And the first time you load it up, you're greeted with the screen where you get to create your own address for your gateway. And you link it to an email address, and that actually downloads and loads up the SSL certificate onto your computer. So it also registers the SSL certificate against your email address, so it becomes your little domain. It also creates a SQLite database on the computer it's running on, 
so that it can work offline. And at this point in time, I should mention, now, I've been saying web a lot. And usually when we talk about web, we think online, you have to have internet. One thing that's really nice about this is that you don't need actual internet. You just need a network connection. So you need all of these things to be connected to the same network. Even if your internet is down, they will still work. You just won't be able to access them from outside the network. It uses MDNS for discovery of the different de devices so that it's just on the local network itself. So even though from outside you would access your domain with that, from inside your network you can still go to localhost 8080 and it will show you your same gateway. Once you create this, you're prompted to create your user account. Again, email address, name, and password. You can create as many user accounts as you want. And let's get to the demo of the gateway. Skip there. I'm just going to, no, not right now. NPM start over here. So this is just the code from the GitHub repo. I have run NPM install previously so that we don't sit here while we download the entire internet. Uh, once it starts up, I can go to my demo site. Still, okay, it started up. No, it, it started up. Don't lie to me. There we go. Right. I'm going to put my phone over here closer to the window because it seems to have better connection. <laughs> oh, come on. All right. So while the gateway is starting up, uh, there's a few other things I can uh, tell you about that I was going to show you on the gateway. Um, I don't know why it's taking so long. So. With the add-ons, in order for the Arduino things to work, like th this one here, you have to add something called a web thing native add-on, which is what that library that we added onto the Arduino, the web thing adapter library needs in order for it to work. Goodness. And there's a whole range of other devices that are supported, which is really nice because you don't have to code your own devices. There are things like uh, Zigbee and Z-Wave, which are some of the very popular home automation devices that are supported on the WebThings gateway. This is not going to work, is it? It's, the, it's my internet connection. Hold on. Man. Empty. <laughs> the problem is it. Oh, wait, there we go. Wait for it, wait for it. There we go. <laughs> cool. All right. So, settings. This is where you set up all of your gateway things. So, adding new users, what network you're connecting to, the add ons. All of this stuff is in here. So here's that one add-on that I've installed. There's a bunch of other add-ons that you can connect to. One of the other really cool features is you can upload a floor plan, so like a picture of your house, and then link all of your devices to that floor plan. Uh, so show which device is in which room and things like that. And then the things I actually wanted to show you. So if we click the Add button there, if everything goes according to plan, and this thing is still on. Maybe it's not. Man, this demo is not going well. <laughs> Please work. 
gave. All right, so you can see when you scan for devices, sometimes they show up, um, and you can save it. Uh, uh, so it detects that it's a light, so it shows like a little light bulb. They have different images for the different types. Um, once it's added, if I've plugged it incorrectly, we can turn it on and off. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then the other thing I wanted to show you, and I hope it works, is, um, hold on, I want to turn it off first before I show you this, is the rules to automate things. So the way the rules work is you have an input and an output. So uh, I'm going to say light on notification. So if the warning light is on, then send me a browser notification saying light is on. Cool, and now if we go back here and we turn this on, <laughs> I swear this works. Oh man, I'm just going to move on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, this is part of what I have at home. So, the reason that light is called warning light is because it's part of what I have at, uh, at home. I have two little LEDs that um, notify me when each garage door is open. The rest of the setup is as follows. So, uh, there is an ESP32 per garage door. Um, it's connected close to the garage door motor. There is a little reed switch that is connected on, uh, on the wall next to the garage door with a magnet on the actual door. That way, when the magnet moves away, the reed switch detects that it is open. And then there is also a relay. The relay is for opening or closing the garage door. So if you've ever opened your garage door motor, you might see something like this. It's also a relay. And when you connect those two wires together, it's like the equivalent of pushing the button on your remote for your garage door. So every time you touch them with a connecting wire, it will start opening or closing the garage door depending on where it is. So that's what the relay does on the ESP32. It turns on for a fraction of a second so that the garage door can start opening or closing. And I have a little video. Now, the video is hopefully going to play. All right, the first thing I want you to concentrate on is that. That is the button for the relay. All right, push the button. Now, over there is the LEDs. And over there is the door sensor and the little light sensor. So as the door starts opening, you can see the LED turns on and the door sensor says the door is now open. And it opens all the way. And then you can't stop it halfway, but I just. Then you push the button again. Right? And then the door starts closing. And as soon as the door closes completely, you'll see the LED will go off and the door sensor will say that it's now closed. That's it. That's the setup at home. <laughs> right. So, as I said earlier, um, I'm just started this stuff. I've only automated my gar garage doors so far. I'm still automating more things. So follow me on Twitter if you would like to see more stuff being automated. And with these things becoming standards and being taken seriously on the web, I think we're getting closer to the Internet of Things we deserve. That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? Oh, and my slides were by this really cool website called SlidesGo. Questions? No. Oh, there's one at the back there. Hi. Oh. Um, <coughs> so 
sorry, uh, good presentation. Thanks. Um, in terms of hardware that's already available, um, I know there's Sonoff switches and things like that. Are they supported yet or can you load firmwares? And what's kind of available on the market? So, um, so the Sonoff switches have, uh, have some like uh, uh, pull requests for, for the Mozilla WebThings gateway. I haven't seen any on the gateway itself, so I think there's people still working on them. Uh, they aren't supported completely yet. Uh, the Zigbee and Zig Z-Wave ones are the, uh, the most popular ones that are supported, but there's also a range of sensors, like popular sensors that are supported. So there's like uh, one of the most common uh, temperature sensors called the BME280 is supported by WebThings, so you don't have to even like program it as long as it's connected to the uh, to the thing it uh, yeah so there's so there's a, a few different ones they're all in the add-ons and if my internet was faster I could show you but you can go check it out <laughs> yeah 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 um, so I did, I did I'm not sure because I arrived late so I don't know if you're working for Mozilla yourself or what but uh, I have a question with the gateway I saw they talks about creating an account on the Mozilla mm -hmm. IoT, what, what. So my question is, what if I wanted to run that, you know, without uh, creating an account on the Mozilla side of things, like totally self-managed? Is it possible to, to, to get so the code and run it for myself? So yeah, it, it runs with NPM start, right? So you are still running it. It's still running on localhost. On your computer, on my computer currently, the gateway I showed you was running on my computer. Every everything is stored on my computer. If at any point in time I want to delete the stuff, I just go and delete it. It it's just creates a little folder on your on your computer that that has all of the stuff on it. So then just a follow-up question on that. Does that mean that that account that you created and got from the Mozilla website is literally just to host it or to give you a gateway so that when you're not at home, when you're you, not on your Wi-Fi, you can still access can, it? Yeah, yeah. So, so, the account, the, so the account I created is actually only stored in the SQLite database on the computer. The, um, Mozilla doesn't store any of that information. The only thing they store is your email address and the domain you registered so that they can register the certificate for you. That's the only thing they store. The account details themselves are actually stored on this computer. So if you go and delete that stuff, you then have to create a new account. And you can reclaim the domain name again uh, if, it, if you link it to the same email address. Any other questions? I think the biggest question here is security. So are you happy with the security that Mozilla provides just with a certificate? So it's it's um it's a registered SSL certificate, right? So if you if you trust SSL then I yeah. <laughs> it's it's uh, so the only yeah, so the only thing that Mozilla has is is the fact that they register the certificate for you and they have your email address. That's the only thing they get from you when you register this. So it's a bit, yeah, it's not like you're putting everything that you know and love on there. <laughs> they can't control my garage doors, that's all I'm saying. I think. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, thank you. <laughs>